Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and happy in an International Women's Day. Welcome today to this very special edition of EJN webinar. I'm Stella Paul, your moderator for the day. Today, we're going to celebrate the International Women's Day with you. And on this occasion, we do have a very special discussion on a report that while it's not totally surprising, is going to be of deep interest to many of you. Uh, the report is on underrepresentation of women in environmental journalism. But first, before I go the, uh, to, to the report and before I introduce you to our panelists, let me just say a line about uh, some house rules. Um, we have uh, today a three panelists with us and they are also from uh, journalism and media sector. So obviously uh, we do want this webinar to be as interactive as possible. And we do uh, welcome you uh, and your questions. Uh, to ask your questions, however, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can use the chat button only to speak uh, with a fellow uh, attendee. We won't be monitoring uh, the chat uh, page, uh, but yeah, your, the Q&A button, we are, we are going to regularly monitor that and we're going to look at your questions and uh, we will definitely try to see that your question is answered during this webinar. With that said, uh, let me now quickly introduce uh, you to our today's panelist. So today we have a truly global panel panel here. Uh, first on my screen, we have uh, Sarah Shandart. Um, Sarah is the former editor of uh, Earth Journalism Network and now is a climate global climate change journalist. Um, Sarah, welcome to uh, this panel. Um, there must be tons of uh, events happening around you, so we do uh, appreciate that you took your time to join us. Um, yeah, you want to say hello, Sarah? <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about this report, and um, happy International Women's Day to you. Uh, next on my screen, I have Oki Madasari. Uh, a very known name in Southeast Asia as the novelist of many books and uh, currently a, uh, a PhD scholar at uh, NSU in Singapore. So, Oki, welcome. And whoa, uh, the, the biggest <laughs> thing that I forgot here is that Oki is uh, one of the lead edit uh, writers of the report that we are shortly going to talk about, while Sarah was the lead editor. Uh, so yeah, okay, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Um, and finally, we have <clears throat> Amar Guerrero, a friend and a known a per, uh, face to, to many of you who have joined us, I'm pretty sure, and one of the finest climate journalists of our time. Uh, Amar is joining us from Karachi, Pakistan. Amar, welcome. Amar, can you unmute and, and just say hello to us? Uh, thank you. Hi, Stella and everybody uh, for having me here. Thank you. Um, so uh, with that uh, introduction, uh, I would now uh, like to take you straight into the topic of discussion today, which is <clears throat> the new EJN report on gender representation in uh, our regional environmental journalism across Asia. Before that, the first thing that came to my mind when we were first planning this webinar is that over the first uh, past few years, <clears throat> there has been a growing uh, level of attention as well as awareness about how well or how bad badly women are represented in the media. We have seen some great studies that have come uh, 
in, in the past few years. For example, in 2015, we read about the Global Media Monitoring Project uh, that told us that only 24% of women are um, <clears throat> you know, represented in across all kind of all news uh, uh, sectors, uh, including radio and television and digital. Um, but when it comes to uh, environmental journalism, again, a very rapidly expanding um, <clears throat> uh, uh, sec sector in, 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 in media, uh, the, the, the picture is, is, is actually quite dark. We, we don't know, we don't know, uh, you know, how many of the women voices are, are being represented, how well women's perspectives are being represented, how many women experts are being interviewed too. So if somebody uh, wants to, wants to, you know, wanted to, to study, wanted to read about this, uh, there wasn't a, a lot of resources, probably not, not credible enough at least. The good news here uh, today is that we finally have something, a tool that can help us of, you know, at least to remove some of this, this, this darkness and give us, uh, you know, at least um, some insight into uh, how, how, how well women are represented uh, in environmental journalism. So, the, uh, and this is where, this is what this, this report, uh, you know, where are the women? Our, I see our, our uh, tech host has already shared the link to this report. You can look at your chat box and find the link and you can download it. You can go through the report later. So this report was uh, done by a team of, uh, AJN uh, with liberal help with ex some excellent writers and editors and, and journalists like Amar who all came together to put their best foot forward to, to make sure that we get the picture as accurate as possible. So our researchers and our writers actually covered quite a large area across uh, the Asia region. Um, so we have some some pictures from uh, starting from Pakistan to Indonesia to India and 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 some other other countries as well. But uh, it is not my place, <laughs> I would say, to talk about the report definitely. And this is why we have uh, the editor here today. And I'm so glad uh, that um, Sarah Shandart, who was the lead editor, uh, could be with us. Um, Sarah. You know, the first thing that probably uh, I was pro thinking uh, is that wh why this report? I mean, environmental journalism in many countries is still in its infancy or probably taking just the, the first steps. And we still don't even have a proper, you know, uh, it, it, many across many media outlets, even some of the very established media outlets still don't have a regular section dedicated to environment. So it, when this journalism is just kind of, it's not yet quite happening, uh, just, just uh, you know, coming of age, why do we, why, why this study, why this report? Uh, what was the reason? And okay. also uh, looking at other, other uh, recent studies, I'm guessing that this was probably not uh, one of the easiest things to do. So could you just take us there you know, what, what really went behind uh, the scene? How did you plan this report? What was the reason? And how did it all come together with such a big team and, you know, covering such a large area uh, geographically? Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, I, I would say it was also actually quite a small team for such a big, big uh, report or a big topic to tackle, but it was, years in the making and really it stemmed from the work that the Earth Journalism Network does, which is provide support to environmental reporters to be better at our craft and to 
um, make sure that we're covering all the different angles and including all the different voices and how they're impacted. And I think as anyone on this call and anyone who's reported on the environment is well aware, the impacts of environmental degradation and climate change affect people differently depending on their circumstances, where they're from, um, what challenges they face more broadly in society. And we realized, you know, as, as many of us do, that women have uh, are impacted in different ways and are often the, the ones who bear the brunt of the impacts of climate change, environmental degradation. And so having their representation in stories is important because they do provide a unique perspective. So that's sort of the why of this study and why um, it matters to make sure that there is gender diversity and gender inclusion in all reporting, but particularly environmental reporting. Um, the origins of this report actually stems from a pilot project that EJN did where we started tracking um, the number of women who appeared in the stories that we support through two of our grant projects. Um, and the idea with that was to see how and when women appeared in stories. Um, were they, were there women experts in the story or were they providing a first person narrative? Um, if it was a story that was sort of integral to a woman's experience, um, were women evenly represented? And so of more than 120 stories we analyzed, we found that only about a third of the sources were women. Um, and nearly 25% of those stories had no women sources. Uh, we also found that women, uh, most of the stories where women accounted for the majority of sources were written by female reporters. And so we had something to go on for the, the genesis of this report. We wanted to take the findings that we had found from this tracker and, and uh, broaden that out. Um, as part of that pilot, we also asked a number of reporters in our network a series of questions like whether they found it difficult um, to find gender experts who are women or whether having a gender balance in stories mattered. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, there is a reason for, for, uh, for that in, in approaching our reporting. So that brings us to this current study. Um, we picked uh, a series of countries where we do a lot of work. Um, and I will let the two other panelists speak to that more directly. Um, but we wanted to really dive in and find out what challenges um, reporters faced um, and in both finding sources, but then also dealing with another structural constraint within the journalism industry, which is just the place that women themselves have in journalism. Um, so, you know, there are both structural constraints and cultural and social constraints um, that make it harder for women to access sources, but also for women to harder for women to operate in the field of journalism. And what we found um, is within newsrooms, for example, women seldom hold leadership positions, which makes it harder for their interests to factor into newsroom conversations or impacts the types of beat, beats that they cover. Um, within the world of environmental journalism, often women aren't assigned to cover sort of hard hitting investigative environmental stories. Um, we heard that women are kind of given the softer, fluffier stories often, um, or when they are assigned a story, there might be safety concerns um, where they could benefit from the support of an editor, just being aware that they have you know, challenges with access. Um, and that's where having a female editor matters. Um, I think another issue that we came across is when it comes to finding women's sources, in some ways there are pluses and minuses. Um, women sometimes have better access to other women um, who might be experiencing the brunt of climate change impacts. We found this often in communities where women appear as first-hand narrators um, talking about their experience. But when it comes to finding expert sources, there's more of a challenge. Um, we are seeing more efforts being made to compile lists of women's sources that journalists can access based on an area of expertise or country. Um, but many newsrooms also have sort of go-to source lists, particularly for daily reporters who don't have a lot of time um, 
or ability to sort of seek out more diverse sources and new sources, which takes takes time and effort. Um, and then more broadly, that there is generally a, a shortage of women experts in a number of countries, or at least ones that are public facing. Um, as the report outlines, in some countries, for example, women experts are uh, more often inclined to ask a supervisor permission to speak to the media um, or don't have as much of a public facing presence as perhaps their male counterparts, as well as the fact that traditional or generational wisdom often isn't considered an expertise, um, but really it, it, there's such a depth of knowledge there that women hold um, that we need to maybe rethink the way that we consider expertise. Um, and I can talk through some of, of the other conclusions that report comes to. At the end, we do outline a series of recommendations of how we can improve on these challenges and try and address them. And really that was a big goal of this report was to, to tap our network to find out what their challenges are through the authors like Ogi, um, through the journalists to share their experience and then come up with some helpful tips um, that, that reporters can think about, that newsrooms can think about when they're trying to address these challenges. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I think um, for, for any journalist working on the ground, a tool, a resource is truly useful when it not just you know, directs or points at the problem, but also tells them about that the solutions, you know, leads them to solutions. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think um, we'd be interested to know, um, you know, some of the recommendations as well. Um, but uh, right now, uh, the next panelist that I would like to go to is Oki. Oki, as one of the four uh, leading uh, authors uh, of this report. Um, Sarah, we, we just, just mentioned something uh, she, 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 among other things, she said, just, just mentioned cultural constraints. And um, I would like to know, you know, when you were writing this report, um, and you were interacting with, the, you know, you know, the journalist, what are the constraints that you found truly striking and something that probably kind of took you you know, by, by, by surprise. Was there any surprise element or is, is, is this something you have heard before? Yes, uh, if we talk about cultural uh, constraint, cultural barrier, I think it's especially happen when we cover region, not in the city, but in village, in a region that uh, just, uh, you know, environmental disaster, mostly in the region. And then when reporter ca come to the region to do reportage, to, do re to, to cover that issue, they will face the cultural barrier. So for example, if we need some source, uh, some sources to, to gather or to ask them, the woman will feel that they don't entitled to give information. So the woman in many region in Indonesia, from Papua, in Aceh, in uh, Borneo, in Kalimantan, or even in Java, in a village in Java, when there is journalists come and want to ask about what happened in this village, what, uh, how the disaster uh, happened, uh, what happened, uh, why, why this happened, uh, they will choose to let the man to explain. That's uh, what we mean with the cultural uh, barrier. So it comes from the uh, sources. But and then uh, the, the thing is, when we talk about the report and about the gender representation in media, cultural barrier is not the only thing. So I think one of the most important uh, finding is we know that all the journalists are aware of gender equality and gender representation. And I think that's uh, become also trend hype that uh, in our society right now in public sphere, everyone talk about gender equality, everyone talk about gender awareness, about gender representation. But when we 
when it comes to how to represent women in news, in media, it's another thing. So the journalists that are very aware of the gender uh, equality and uh, gender representation, when it comes to how to write a story, suddenly they don't think about gender representation anymore. They, they just want to finish the story. They just want to meet the editor expectation. And editor and newsroom never expect kind of news that give room to women. They just don't think about that when it, it comes to news production. So that's, I think, the, uh, the biggest challenge when we talk about gender representation because there is no requirement in the news production to produce news that give equal room to women or that uh, consider gender represent representation. So uh, in this matter, editors and people in the newsroom uh, have a big responsibility or they should uh, make requirement that all the news need gender representation. And that uh, the situation now is most of the media still don't, uh, still don't care or still don't uh, consider the need um, to, to check every news or to make sure that news uh, printed printed in the newspaper is uh, mid gender uh, equality or gender representation that I think uh, so besides cultural barrier I think the the fact that there is no requirement to, to give women representation Sarah thank you ah, yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you okay um I think, <laughs> you know, listening to you, uh, I, I was actually going back to uh, the, the time the, when, when I was, you know, uh, on the field uh, interviewing women uh, in a disaster zone and uh, the men, not always that the women are, are, are consciously bringing the men out to speak for them, but men themselves just, just coming in front to speak for the women. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm sure that our third panelist of the day, Omar, who is who is who is a uh, reporter here, um, it is is this is probably a, a scenario that he's very well familiar with. So, Omar, we would like to hear from you. Um, you know, first, how was it to be be being a man and and you know working on a report? that focuses on the low representation of women. And the second thing, how many of these barriers that you, you have personally been, been facing and experiencing? Uh, if, yes. Oh, thank you, Estela. Uh, actually, I work in Karachi, Pakistan, and you know Pakistan has a traditional society. We are going into the community and talking to the women is a most difficult part in this country. And uh, since Pakistan is the eighth uh, worst victim to climate change, so we have a variety of uh, manifestation of climate change in terms of uh, drought, take uh, outbursts, sea level rise, desertification, so many things, you name it, and every manifestation of climate change are here in Pakistan. So uh, being a male journalist, because you know in Pakistan we have a lot of the media, and it's uh, uh, it recently it, uh, it has a large number of the, especially the TV channels. Um, more than sixty TV channels exist in country like Pakistan, and but we don't see the female reporters uh, in the media industry. And if we see some female reporters. They are given either to cover some uh, women issues or some soft uh, uh, beats uh, because the editors or the guest editors, they think that uh, women cannot go into the 
a remote area is and uh, being an environment specialist, you know that uh, for environmental studies, you have to travel a lot to the countries and into the remote areas to find the story. So on one side, we don't find a female reporter, and other side, if male reporters are going in a traditional society of Pakistan where women are killed on the name of so-called honor. So the women are not allowed to talk to any stranger male. Um, so it's very, very difficult uh, was for me to find women voices. But actually, I'm very much lucky enough that I work for the independent UK's Urdu language edition in Pakistan. And my editors are well aware of the uh, gender inclusion into the reports. So um, uh, they will sometimes they ask us that we must include the gender into our reports. So I was fortunate enough that I get support from my editors to include the women into my stories, but they are uh, religious and cultural concerns as far as that we cannot find uh, enough women voices from the ground to, to know what challenges they are facing on the ground or any disaster or any drought or sea level rise or any flood or any cyclone, what they are facing, the challenges. The other big thing that I really uh, sometimes find very difficult to find that is the uh, women expert in for the environmental and climate change story. We don't have many experts on climate change, and also there is very less number of the women experts uh, in the field. And as Sarah explained, that whenever we try to talk to them, either they are not allowed from their departments or the Concerned governments that they need a special permission from their authorities, higher ups, to talk to the media. And if they get the permission, then we find that they don't have data, or they don't have any research, they don't have any details about that story. So it is very I mean, it's difficult for a reporter, especially a male reporter in a country like Pakistan, to cover climate change stories while including the women voices into the story. So uh, these are the ground uh, challenges that most of the reporters find there. Thank you, Amar, for, for sharing uh, your experiences of you know, rep uh, working in Pakistan as a reporter and the challenges that you face in, in, in finding women experts. Um, uh, it reminds me that um, today, uh, Today, when I, I was reading the morning news, uh, I'm based in India and I found that today, Indian government has uh, honored a lot of community-based women leaders and you know, working in different sectors. And I found quite a few of them are from environment sector and doing amazing work apparently. And I was thinking like, where were they all these years? How come we don't know about them? So. So the, the, the lack of women experts is probably also because women experts are not, you know, given that kind of exposure. Maybe they are not made available. You, you just mentioned one, one reason here that they need permission from their, their bosses or their superiors to, to speak to the media. So maybe there is a deliberate um, attempt also to, to you know, not letting them be available to the media or to speak to media. Um, but before we go to the second round where we will be talking about the solution to these barriers and the recommendations as, uh, you know, uh, mentioned by this in this report, uh, I would like to ask those, all of those who have joined us today to ask your questions. Uh, please uh, do ask. Um, we, the, the, all of our panelists today are journalists and writers, um, and uh, we love a good, um, you know, level uh, interaction. So please do feel free to ask your questions. And with that, um, I would come to you, Sarah, again. Uh, I was listening to Oki earlier, and she was talking about that how it is not a requirement, fundamental requirement in the newsroom. Uh, 
um, to to change the narrative. And it it reminds me of this 2011, I think that was the year when uh, uh, International Labor Organization published a report, and that said that only four percent of uh, the the regular news media makes a conscious effort uh, to to change uh, the 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 narrative and makes it makes a conscious effort to bridge the gap in the representation level of representation of women and men in the media. So that is a, a, a very frustratingly and a tragically low number, the four percent. Ten years have gone uh, by since then. But it seems uh, like we still haven't, um, you know, uh, uh, still haven't come a long way in terms of bridging that gap. But having said that, maybe individually there is a room for action. Maybe individually every journalist can uh, do something uh, to, to make their personal, their individual stories more gender balanced, more gender equal. So drawing again from your experience, and based on the recommendations that this the report, where are the women makes, could you tell us some of the low hanging fruits that, that the journalists can reach out to? Because Sarah, you yourself mentioned that everybody's so pressed for time. Nobody really has tons of time to sit and do research and find out, you know, they're not, they, are, they don't just have that luxury of time. So how can somebody, you know, do find a quick solution? Yeah, I mean, I think it it starts with awareness. Um, to Oki's point, and I think this is really an important one, um, that that there is an understanding of why gender representation is needed, and that more people are aware that it's important. Um, but often it falls to the side, or it's not um, pursued in our coverage because we don't see it as a part of or necessity for environmental reporting or reporting generally. So I think just having an understanding that it's not needed is important. Um, I, you know, another challenge that we face in journalism is that our resources are really strained increasingly. Um, newsrooms are downsizing, um, budgets are lower, reporters are asked to do more with less time, which makes, you know, thinking about um, how many of our sources are women in the story a little more challenging. Um, but, you know, I think some organizations have started to be more deliberate in the way that they look at their sources. And, and there are a number of organizations that track um, and try and keep a tally of how many women appear in stories just to create that general awareness um, and see where they're falling short. Um, with that, we found, you know, in our questionnaires and in speaking with our network that there is support for um, trainings and gender sensitivity trainings and things that will help journalists and editors better understand um, how 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 to diversify and how to include more uh, more of a gender perspective in their reporting. So you know, trainings are one thing. Um, creating databases of women experts, there are a number of them out there now, um, and we do include links to several of them in the report. A lot of them are global in nature. A lot of them are based in the global north or targeting experts in the global north, but. When we were putting the report together, there um, there was a group of women in India, for example, that was working to build this for a very localized context. So I think um, the, creating these sorts of databases of women experts is helpful because while there's certainly a shortage of women experts, they do exist. It's just a matter of finding access to them. Um, I think another is emphasizing the importance of including women's voices as a way to improve journalistic storytelling. Um, this really presents a more accurate narrative, the environmental impacts um, of things like climate change. You know, this is really a, a, a justice issue. So making sure that women are included as a way to overall improve your reporting. Um, and then back to that point I made earlier about training journalists and media outlets to understand sort of the expertise gap um, and that women experts may not need to be 
from a STEM field necessarily, um, where it might be harder to find them. We did find this, that when, when journalists are reporting on more technical aspects of environmental, um, of the environment, it's harder to find women, but women experts exist, you know, in, in agriculture, um, in other areas where we may not be looking for them necessarily as experts, but where they can provide really valuable resources. So those were some of the recommendations. Um, I think there are 12 points laid out in our report. Um, and Oki uh, and Amara may have more to add to that, but I think those, those were really notable ones for me coming away from this report. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm sure Oki also has has <laughs> has something something uh to 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 add to this list, uh. But uh, my my uh, other question, uh, especially for Rocky, would be, um, you know, one thing is being aware and you know know the the, the technicalities of where to find and how to find the women expert, but um. How about making a conscious, you know, improving our writing style, the, the planning of the story in a way uh, so that it does require a women voice, it does require, you know, some women faces. Yes, uh, that's an uh, important thing. And uh, based on the research, there is interesting fact that there is uh, you know, the way a uh, journalist portraying women, there is typical that women uh, will be source if they become the victim. And it based on several journalists that also supported by EJN, uh, when they, uh, when she did uh, her coverage in several places, uh, she cannot find woman sources because uh, the woman is not really understand about the issue, but they will include woman when the woman impacted or become victim of the disaster. So, and then when we see broader, uh, not not only about the report about the uh, report during the COVID during the pandemic, for example, all the experts in Indonesia about COVID is always men. It's very difficult to find a woman expert about COVID uh, become a, has a get spotlight or get a, give a, get a room in the news. But when it comes to how to tell story about she become victim of the pandemic, then it will be the woman to explain that she lost her husband, she lost her children, that she, she, she lost everything because of COVID. So when we want to uh, increase expert, woman expert in media, we have to move from that, uh, that of a typical coverage. I mean, of course, we have to give voice or we have to give opportunity all the women that impacted, all the women that become victim. Of course, uh, we don't deny it. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, say that we don't need to, to give space for women that become victim, no. But we, we also need to consider that Woman should be more than victim. That woman can be an expert, and there are so many expert, uh, woman expert about any issue, including when we when you're talking about um, about forest, when you're talking about mining, when you're talking about any disaster, even the woman who live in the village, they know about the their environment. They, they know about uh, her village, but like what I said, when it becomes to please explain what happened in your village, they don't want to explain, but what happened with your kid? Why, why how he died? Maybe, maybe she will explain. So that's, uh, I think there is also culture barrier in the way of we 
portray the woman and write about the woman. Thank you, Stella. So if I heard you well, okay, okay, there is definitely a room for, you know, some individual effort to break the stereotypes as well. And, and probably a better planning of, of the story, how I want to tell the story, you know, through whose eyes uh, do, I, do I want to tell the story. That itself would also help. Uh, and and or not, not always, you know, to just look for women or show women as victims, but women probably we could go a step further and then look for women who have survived or women who have probably helped another victim survive. Yeah. So, and I, yeah. If I can just say one thing there, I think this is, is to Oki's point as well. Often they're both. So women can be victims of climate change, but also be a leader in their community. But they're not going to come out front and center and say that they're a leader in the community because women often don't. Um, <laughs> they're not so barani, you know. They're not. They're not. That's not their sort of approach often to issues but it's a it's about being aware as a journalist to know to ask the questions and to find out maybe this woman has a story as a victim but also is a leader in what's happening in this community yes. okay. that's okay, a, that's a great point and i would say that that probably is also part of your 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 you know homework that you want to do before you actually go into the field and yeah, in, you know, integrate that, make it integral to your planning of the story. Um, um, so with that, I would, I would uh, go to Amar, but uh, with something that Sarah began, uh, you know, with her, with her tips and that was training. So nobody can deny the power of, of, of a training uh, because it's not just, uh, you know, reshapes your, your storytelling uh, it can also, you know, like as, as Sarah said, it can do so much, you know, help you help, you know, uh, up your, the level of your awareness, make you understand, or as Aki said, you know, help you see <clears throat> through a different lens altogether, where you then become uh, able to, to change the, or break the stereotype or change the narrative yourself. So Omar, uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, how much as a reporter uh, you value training, and how do you think that training, especially in the in the in the context of South Asia or Pakistan, how much a training could help, uh, you know, right the very wrong or imbalanced representation that we have today of women? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, Pakistan uh, is always in the political turmoil country. There is always the uh, political crisis in this country. So most of the media houses, they are not reporting uh, the other important issues like environment and climate change. So yes, you are right. Uh, training plays an essential role as I, being a fellow of the EGEN's different program, I got training from the different international experts and giving the workshops, training sessions with us, journalism network. So I find myself uh, uh, to some extent uh, uh, knowing this subject. Uh, being a reporter, I will advise to the other reporters uh, who are reporting environmental uh, journalism or other issues. They must first means think that why it is important to include the women voices. Why it is very important to include them. Because women are the half of our population. Women are the uh, most victims. They are most vulnerable, especially in environmental degradation and the climate change uh, events. So you need to means, consider them as uh, to include into your reporting. That is very important. First thing I suggest reporters to mean uh, consider yourself to to get some information, to get some training on why to include women voices in your reporting. And for that there are many webinars, our channel of the networks are webinars, there are many organizations which are providing training to the journalists on the importance of the women issue. 
and also when you include women voices, your readers are interested to read those stories because it's very powerful voices They're coming from the community or from the ground. So first thing the reporter must consider to think on why these voices be included. After that, if uh, means we are complaining that there are we cannot find women voices, uh, but if you can just uh, I suggest you to follow those international organizations which are working on women issues. Those uh, women organizations which are working in the community, like you can follow their social media pages to check their events, to go through their press releases, uh, like UN uh, women uh, are working, or the United Nations is working on the ground. So sometimes they are issuing on their social media uh, the community voices. So you can just uh, follow those voices, or you can just contact to these organizations that I'm going to a flood uh, affected area in some certain uh, part of Pakistan or India or anywhere. So I need some local context of the women groups or the women uh, themselves so that I can talk to them. So you can just go with their reference, with getting the context and go and find uh, those women and include them into your story. Also, we reporters, most of the reporters, especially in South Asia, they are uh, complaining that they don't find any women experts, so I suggest them. It's better to, they can see the different international organizations, uh, not for the uh, government's statement or response on the particular uh, issue, like any cloud or anything else, but they can just uh, write an email to those international organizations that in this part of the world, this thing is happening, so being an expert, what is your say? So by this way, we can find uh, the women voices at the ground and also at the international level so that we can include them into our report. I think that is the best. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Amor. Great Amor. tips in there. We are having some, so we, we already have some questions. Uh, uh, one of the questions, Amor, stay with us. Uh, this is the question that I would like to take to you. Uh, you know, how can journalists convince editors that it is important to stay on a story um, and, and not, you know, uh, if, if, if I think the question means, the person means that when a, a journalist is under pressure to meet the deadline, how do we convince uh, the editor that, you know, it is important to, to do the story in the right way and how can you convince the editor to, <laughs> to to kind of ease or lower the pressure of quickly finish it? Uh, Amar, you can unmute yourself. You are mute. Okay. Uh, so first consider that the first reader of your story is the your editor. So if you will inspire, inspire your editor, he will be willing to take the story. So give him or her a great angle, an interesting angle, a story, a great storytelling that ma'am or sir, this woman is the story, is the character that can I can take into my uh, story that, can, that will make my story more powerful. So just editor, that if you will not take these voices, your report will not be complete. So means try to means discuss with the editor and give them some uh, powerful stories from the ground, including the women voice. Okay, so nothing works no, as no, nothing works like you know a, a great example uh, of a success, or maybe the example of a success story. So you can you can talk to your editor about you know uh, how how. A story can be impactful if you stay on the story and, uh, you know, give it a little more time uh, rather than just rushing through it and finishing it somehow. Right, Amar? Yes, sorry. I was, uh, can you please uh, repeat this? I was, I, I was saying that, that if, I, if I understood you correctly, uh, the, your tip is, that just try to talk to your editor 
give him a good example of a past success story and try to tell him that or her that uh, you know it's it's good to the story probably will become become more impactful if you give it a little more time and not just rush through it. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That reporter must learn that why women voices are important and train themselves that they must think up on every story that to include the women voices. So whenever they find any story, so make it in an interesting way and then pitch it to your editor because the first reader of your story is your editor. So if you will just please explain him or her that this story, which is comprises the women voices, are the story. I need to do it, and I means try to to uh, let him or her understand that this is the story, and we have to do it. So you train yourself first, and then whenever you work, just try to include the women voices. Thank you, Amar. Next, I would like to go to Oki. Um, okay. So training, uh, the power of training is beyond any doubt, beyond any question. But how much? Uh, the designing, uh, 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 you know, a gender sensitive training uh, actually matters. Uh, okay, that's a difficult question because it's not based uh, from our research. Our research is not uh, how to design uh, such a training for newsroom or for editors, but uh, I have done module, uh, I, I, I have done module how to conduct gender training for company actually, uh, like two years ago. So I believe that gender awareness should become basic training for everyone in every uh, company. And when we talk to media, it should be uh, part of the basic training for uh, you know newcomer so when you just start your career at the media you have to get gender training that's first that's basic thing and then uh, how how we design the training it's of course it's uh, it's uh, it started from the basic knowledge it it started from the perspective because I believe gender is not, you know, gender awareness or gender uh, gender knowledge or gender uh, perspective is not kind of ideology that you believe or you don't believe. It's part of basic skill. So as a reporter, as an editor, you should possess that kind of skill. So give a um, gender training since the beginning of your career is necessary. The fact is now in Indonesia, that kind of training is, is there is no that kind of training in every media. So training for uh, gender equality only uh, give, uh, only conduct by the organization like Internews or maybe like IG when they get supported, they get funding to make uh, training, but it's not compulsory. It's not basic requirement for every media. So we have to start now that we uh, that all reporter, all journalists should pass uh, gender training. It includes the uh, you know the anti-sexual harassment, anti-sexual uh, violence uh, training. And it's still, there is no such kind of training in Indonesia. I know that some international company or some international organization now uh, give uh, or conduct that kind of training. But for general, in media, there is no that kind of training. Uh, that. Uh, about the training. And then the second thing, when the question is, I back to the question, how as a journalist you convince the editor? I don't see that this is part of the job of the journalist to convince the editor. I don't believe it. So I don't believe that journalists need to convince or can to convince. So I, I, I prefer to 
to think about how we can make change because we, we still don't start with the beginning or with the uh, early process of the career of the journalist. So we can start now by give training to the leaders in the newsroom. So editors, the leaders of the newsroom is the our main target to give uh, to, to get the perspective or the importance of the gender equality because they are the key. So I think uh, that's urgent for uh, EGN for internews to approach the leader of the newsroom. Uh, I think, okay. I think the, the no, idea, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. I think if I can add uh, uh, my my personal note about our research is is just research on the uh, reporter on journalists who do cover, but we don't uh, interview the decision maker, the editors in the media. So I think that's the lack of our research. Or maybe that is the next destination. <laughs> I, <Okay>. if, <laughs> if, we, if we look in the, at the brighter side, but okay, this is kind of, uh, this, this is a, uh, less talked about and yet Totally, I totally agree that this is an urgent issue. Um, I remember uh, being being in uh, workshops where uh, we were talking about gender issues, uh, misrepresentation of women in the media, and all that in this where uh, just just um, you know entry level or mid career level journalist and the editors were not included. So the first question was, how is this message ever going to uh, to, to the media and never going to get published because like you said, we have also kind of entertained or even encouraged the trend that it is the journalist's job to go back and convince the editor, uh, but um, it should be, it should not be that way. And that takes me to the, to the next uh, great, uh, very um, interesting question that we have is, uh, how can we uh, incentivize and or motivate newsroom editors to support journalists to include more women voices. So Sarah, could you could you uh, take this, this question? Yeah, I mean, I think um, to, to Oki's point about reaching out to editors and leadership, it's, it's proven challenging um, because they're even more time constrained than reporters often in terms of at least wanting to reach out on this issue and to engage about it and have a conversation. I think what motivates newsroom leadership and those who are in charge of the business of the newsroom often is the market and looking at where their readership is coming from. And so I would say in a lot of ways, if newsrooms aren't making decisions for future readership, will, which includes young people who have more awareness about the need for gender inclusion, about the need for more diverse diversity in their coverage, about environmental justice issues, then they are sort of in a way missing out on a whole new audience. I think also supporting newsrooms that um, support women makes it easier for news leadership because if you're not being supportive of women, they often leave when issues of childcare become a concern or women. I know many female journalists who left the profession when they wanted to have children. And so I think supporting women to stay in the newsroom, to be in the newsroom, supporting a new generation of readership that includes more women um, is a really good argument for uh, why media outlets and why editors should be thinking about this, this as an audience, why they should be including women's voices on top of the fact that it, I mean, some of the best stories are very women focused. They really get to the heart of what is happening in environment, in the world of, you know, environmentalism. Um, I think that not including those voices is really missing a story. Um, and, and every negotiation with an editor is like a dance. Like so you may not be able to, to get the story you need to get out at the end of the day if you're looking for a female source and, and that's like a loss for that day, but go back to it tomorrow with a better story and, and fight for that story that day. Um, so I guess that's where I would leave it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I do agree totally that 
there are good stories, uh, but there just isn't enough of them. And also changes are coming. We do read some stories that have a very balanced view, balanced representation. It's just that this is not happening fast enough or maybe they're just happening sporadically. So there probably is no shortcut here. We just have to stay on the stay on the course <laughs> and and just uh, you know keep keep repeating this and yeah follow the recommendations. Talking about the recommendations, we are we are you know uh, on the hour mark here, um, and uh, I would like to ask a quick question to Amar. One of the recommendations of the uh, the HN report is uh, creating a database of experts. Um, as a reporter, how much do you think uh, having a database of all women expert would help you? I love this idea, and I really like that idea that somebody is going to means compile a list of the experts um, where every a reporter can means access. So that will be very very helpful for the reporters uh, on the ground. Uh, because sometimes we are missing, and you know, climate change, our environment is a bigger, many, many beats are within uh, within that beat means, like we need a water expert, agriculture expert, urban pollution expert, we need on many subjects. So that will be really great. And uh, I request Sarah, any, uh, you and everybody, that if you are considering, please consider Pakistan taking experts from here. So that we can find some expert for our stories. And that's really, really great idea. Thank you, Amar. I think it would be, I mean, you know, that, that, that to know that, uh, you know, as a reporter, this would be a great resource for you. It's very encouraging. And I'm sure that whoever, you know, takes the first step, whoever is now uh, taking this idea home to create a database would definitely keep Pakistan on their list and definitely you know uh, include the voices of you know women experts so having said that you know it, it is the international women's day everybody has other things planned probably hoping planning to hop on to other other webinars and other events so thank you once again for being with us here thank you for talking about this report thank you for sharing your experiences and your other tips and ideas I hope this will be useful and yeah, go ahead now and have a great day and Thanks. we'll be in touch again soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.